7. January 1975 Todd left school by himself after the last bell, got his bike, and pedaled down to the park. He found a deserted bench, set his Schwinn up on its kickstand, and took his report card out of his hip pocket. He took a look around to see if there was anyone in the area he knew, but the only other people in sight were two high school kids making out by the pond and a pair of gross-looking winos passing a paper bag back and forth. Dirty fucking winos, he thought. But it wasn't the winos that had upset him. He opened his card. English C. American History C. Earth Science D. Your Community and You B. Primary French F. Beginning Algebra F. He stared at the grades, unbelieving. He had known it was going to be bad, but this was disaster. Maybe that's best, an inner voice spoke up suddenly. Maybe you even did it on purpose because a part of you wants it to end, needs for it to end, before something bad happens. He shoved the thought roughly aside. Nothing bad was going to happen. Dusander was under his thumb, totally under his thumb. The old man thought one of Todd's friends had a letter, but he, he didn't know which friend. If anything happened to Todd, anything, that letter would go to the police. Once he supposed Dusander might have tried it anyway. Now he was too old to run, even with a head start. He's under control, damn it, Todd whispered, and then pounded his thigh hard enough to make the muscle knot. Talking to yourself was bad shit. Crazy people talk to themselves. He had picked up the habit over the last six weeks or so and didn't seem able to break it. He'd caught several people looking at him strangely because of it. A couple of them had been teachers, and that asshole Bernie Everson had come right out and asked him if he was going fruit crackers. Todd had come very, very close to punching a little pansy in the mouth, and that sort of stuff, brawl, scuffles, punch-outs, was no good. That sort of stuff got you noticed in all the wrong ways. Talking to yourself was bad, right, okay, but... The dreams are bad, too, he whispered. He didn't catch himself that time. Just lately, the dreams had been very bad. In the dreams, he was always in uniform, although the type varied. Sometimes it was a paper uniform, and he was standing in line with hundreds of gaunt men. The smell of burning was in the air, and he could hear the choppy roar of bulldozer engines. Then Dusander would come up the line, pointing out this one or that one. They were left. The others were marched away toward the crematoriums. Some of them kicked and struggled, but most were too undernourished, too exhausted. Then Dusander was standing in front of Todd. Their eyes met for a long, paralyzing moment, and then Dusander leveled a faded umbrella at Todd. Take this one to the laboratories, Dusander said in the dream. His lip curled back to reveal his false teeth. Take this American boy. In another dream, he wore an SS uniform. His jackboots were shined to a mirror-like reflecting surface. The death's head insignia and the lightning bolts glittered. But he was standing in the middle of Santo Donato Boulevard and everyone was looking at him. They began to point. Some of them began to laugh. Others looked shocked, angry, or revolted. In this dream, an old car came to a squalling, creaky halt, and Dusander peered out at him, a Dusander who looked two hundred years old and nearly mummified, his skin a yellowed scroll. I know you, the dream Dusander proclaimed shrilly. He looked around at the spectators and then back to Todd. You were in charge at Patton. Look, everybody. This is the blood fiend of Patton, Himmler's efficiency expert. I denounce you, murderer. I denounce you, butcher. I denounce you, killer of infants. I denounce you. In yet another dream, he wore a striped convict's uniform and was being led down a stone-walled corridor by two guards who looked like his parents. Both wore conspicuous yellow armbands with the Star of David on them. Walking behind them was a minister, reading from the book of Deuteronomy. Todd looked back over his shoulder and saw that the minister was Dusander, and he was wearing the black tunic of an SS officer. 
At the end of the stone corridor, double doors opened on an octagonal room with glass walls. There was a scaffold in the center of it. Behind the glass walls stood ranks of emaciated men and women, all naked, all watching with the same dark, flat expression. On each arm was a blue number. It's all right, Todd whispered to himself. It's okay, really. Everything's under control. A couple that had been making out glanced over at him. Todd stared at them fiercely, daring them to say anything. At last they looked back the other way. Had the boy been grinning? Todd got up, jammed his report card into his hip pocket and mounted his bike. He pedaled down to a drugstore two blocks away. There he bought a bottle of ink eradicator and a fine point pen that dispensed blue ink. He went back to the park. The make-out couple was gone, but the winos were still there, stinking the place up and changed his English grade to a B, American history to A, earth science to B, primary French to C, and beginning algebra to B. Your community and you he eradicated and then simply wrote in again, so the card would have a uniform look. Uniforms, right. Never mind, he whispered to himself. That'll hold them. That'll hold them, all right. One night late in the month... Sometime after two o'clock, Kurt Dusander awoke, struggling with the bedclothes, gasping and moaning into a darkness that seemed close and terrifying. He felt half suffocated, paralyzed with fear. It was as if a heavy stone lay on his chest, and he wondered if he could be having a heart attack. He clawed in the darkness for the bedside lamp and almost knocked it off the nightstand, turning it on. I'm in my own room, he thought. My own bedroom, here in Santa Donato, here in California, here in America. See the same brown drapes pulled across the same window, the same bookshelves filled with dime paperbacks from the bookshop on Soren Street, same gray rug, same blue wallpaper. No heart attack, no jungle, no eyes. But the terror still clung to him like a stinking pelt and his heart went on racing. The dream had come back. He had known that it would, sooner or later, if the boy kept on. The cursed boy. He thought the boy's letter of protection was only a bluff, and not a very good one at that, something he had picked up from the TV detective programs. What friend would the boy trust not to open such a momentous letter? No friend. That was who. Or so he thought. If he could be sure. His hands closed with an arthritic, painful snap, and then opened slowly. He took the packet of cigarettes from the table and lit one, scratching the wooden match on the bedpost. The clock's hands stood at 2.41. There would be no more sleep for him this night. He inhaled smoke and then coughed it out in a series of racking spasms. No more sleep, unless he wanted to go downstairs and have a drink or two. Or three. And there had been altogether too much drinking over the last six weeks or so. He was no longer a young man who could toss them off one after the other, the way he had when he had been an officer on leave in Berlin in 39, when the scent of victory had been in the air, and everywhere you heard the Fuhrer's voice, saw his blazing, commanding eyes. The boy, the cursed boy. Be honest, he said aloud and the sound of his own voice in the quiet room made him jump a little. He was not in the habit of talking to himself, but neither was it the first time he had ever done so. He remembered doing it off and on during the last few weeks at Patin, when everything had come down around their ears, and in the east the sound of Russian thunder grew louder, first every day and then every hour. It had been natural enough to talk to himself then. He had been under stress, and people under stress often do strange things, cup their testicles through the pockets of their pants, click their teeth together. Wolf had been a great teeth clicker. He grinned as he did it. Hoffman had been a finger snapper and a thigh patter, creating fast, intricate rhythms that he seemed utterly unaware of. He, Kurt Dusander, had sometimes talked to himself. But now... You are under stress again, he said aloud. He was aware that he had spoken in German this time. He hadn't spoken German in many years. 
But the language now seemed warm and comfortable. It lulled him, eased him. It was sweet and dark. Yes, you are under stress because of the boy. But be honest with yourself. It is too early in the morning to tell lies. You have not entirely regretted talking. At first you were terrified that the boy could not or would not keep his secret. He would have to tell a friend who would tell another friend, and that friend would tell too. But if he has kept it this long, he will keep it longer. If I am taken away, he loses his... his talking book. Is that what I am to him? I think so. He fell silent, but his thoughts went on. He had been lonely. No one would ever know just how lonely. There had been times when he thought almost seriously of suicide. He made a bad hermit. The voices he heard came from the radio. The only people who visited were on the other side of a dirty glass square. He was an old man, and although he was afraid of death, he was more afraid of being an old man who was alone. His bladder sometimes tricked him. He would be halfway to the bathroom when a dark stain spread on his pants. In wet weather, his joints would first throb and then begin to cry out, and there had been days when he had chewed an entire tin of arthritis pain formula between sunrise and sunset, and still the aspirin only subdued the aches. Even such acts as taking a book from the shelf or switching the TV channel became an essay in pain. His eyes were bad. Sometimes he knocked things over, barked his shins, bumped his head. He lived in fear of breaking a bone and not being able to get to the telephone. And he lived in fear of getting there and having some doctor uncover his real past as he became suspicious of Mr. Denker's non-existent medical history. The boy had alleviated some of those things. When the boy was here, he could call back the old days. His memory of those days was perversely clear. He spilled out a seemingly endless catalogue of names and events, even the weather of such and such a day. He remembered Private Henry, who manned a machine gun in the Northeast Tower, and the when Private Henry had between his eyes. Some of the men called him Three Eyes, or Old Cyclops. He remembered Kessel, who had a picture of his girlfriend naked, lying on a sofa with her hands behind her head. Kessel charged the men to look at it. He remembered the names of the doctors and their experiments, thresholds of pain, the brain waves of dying men and women, physiological retardation, effects of different sorts of radiation, dozens more, hundreds more. He supposed he talked to the boy as all old men talk, but he guessed he was luckier than most old men, who had impatience, disinterest, or outright rudeness for an audience. His audience was endlessly fascinated. Were a few bad dreams too high a price to pay? He crushed out his cigarette, lay looking at the ceiling for a moment, and then swung his feet out onto the floor. He and the boy were loathsome, he supposed, feeding off each other, eating each other. If his own belly was sometimes sour with the dark but rich food they partook of in his afternoon kitchen... What was the boy's like? Did he sleep well? Perhaps not. Lately, Dusander thought the boy looked rather pale and thinner than when he had first come into Dusander's life. He walked across the bedroom and opened the closet door. He brushed hangers to the right, reached into the shadows, and brought out the sham uniform. It hung from his hand like a vulture skin. He touched it with his other hand, touched it, and then stroked it. After a very long time, he took it down and put it on, dressing slowly, not looking into the mirror until the uniform was completely buttoned and belted and the sham fly zipped. He looked at himself in the mirror then and nodded. He went back to bed, lay down and smoked another cigarette. When it was finished, he felt sleepy again. He turned off the bed lamp, not believing it, that it could be this easy. But he was asleep five minutes later, and this time his sleep was dreamless.